Welcome to PAC TV Community News. I'm Julie Thompson. And I'm Maureen Boyle. On this episode of PCN, we stop in to check out the planetarium at PCIS. We meet the new director of Plymouth's Department of Public Health and we gather at a new business in Pembroke. We stop into the South Shore Community Action Council's Local Hero Awards and we have Andrew Bottieri from the Plymouth Bay Cultural District on set to talk about Art Week. But we start tonight's show in Kingston. Do you have some stuff in your house that you're having a hard time getting rid of because you don't want to just throw it away? Well, if you're not going to keep it or pay to put it in storage and you live in Kingston, you can bring it to the swap shop. Brian Sullivan went to the Kingston transfer station to bring us this next story. After several years of plans to bring a swap shop to the Kingston transfer station, the opportunity finally presented itself to the South Shore Recycling Committee in the form of this trailer. This one-time construction trailer and home to animal control was just sitting there. So sticking to their principles of reduce, reuse and recycle, the group got permission from the town selectmen to reuse it. Now visitors to the transfer station have a place where people can get rid of things without throwing them away. Even though the trailer is on the property of the transfer station, it's its own separate entity and not under the purview of the Kingston DPW. What that means is whatever happens there is up to members of the recycling committee. What they'd like to see is that people make no more than one visit per day, spending no longer than 10 minutes picking things up and dropping things off. Those are actually the second and third rules of Swap Shop. The first rule of Swap Shop is if you leave something, take something. It's not strictly enforced, but if practiced, it will reduce clutter. A lot of people feel uncomfortable with throwing something away that's useful or still good. Or what, and, and so now we've given an opportunity for some place they can drop it off. And some, you can go through, the, the stuff changes all the time. That, you, know, you can find all kinds of treasures in there. Inside, there are shelves made with repurposed wood loaded with everything from glassware to lamps and all points in between. Ideally, someone from the recycling committee can stop by once a day to keep the place organized. Of course, there are some items that can't be brought in. Well, it's mostly common sense stuff, no shops, things, no electrical things. We don't want stuff in there. We don't want it to be end up a place where people dump things. Located in the back corner of the transfer station, visitors will have a difficult time not seeing the big gray trailer as they pass through. I think it's kind of like the donut shop. It attracts a lot of people and we have a lot of people going through and, and it's an opportunity to, for education. That's one of our charges is to educate people about the benefits of recycling. For PCN in Kingston, I'm Brian Sullivan. The Plymouth Public Schools completed a thorough renovation of the Blake Planetarium last August. The Planetarium, which is located at Plymouth Community Intermediate School, opened its doors to the public on August 21st, the day of the eclipse, to show off the upgrades. Recently, the district decided to host public educational events, and PCN stopped by for the Out of This World experience. As a gift from town meeting, we received approximately a quarter million dollars and through that we were able to remove the old equipment we were able to get the dome cleaned and painted and we were able to get all of the new equipment that we needed plus all of the required software the system is the equivalent to that uh, which is in Boston at the Science Museum. We were open for the eclipse in August and there was such a huge response from the community and interest. We have been open since the school year began running programs for the kids in Plymouth. Our focus is on students, it will always be on students. But since everything has really been fine-tuned, we have open to the public and we now do ticketed shows. So we've had one ticketed show, we had also our rededication ceremony, and so this is our second ticketed show. Huge response from the community, uh, definitely what we have heard so far is they love it. The tickets that we sell go back into purchasing new licenses. So we will continue to kind of feed that system so the more folks who come will be able to see more shows. What's really great about this system is that it takes the old system, which was just from the perspective of Earth, and it changes it so that when we're doing astronomy-based activities, we can actually be in the perspective of the Milky Way. We can be outside the Milky Way. We can be standing on Mars. We can be in any place that you could conceivably think of um, and not have to be standing on the Earth for the astronomy aspect. Because of the capability with the video, we're also able to do 
many more things than just astronomy. For instance, Habitat Earth, which we're showing tonight, is really life science, earth science, and um, space science as well. So it definitely has a lot more functionality. We can have a TV do programs. We can have students in high school who are using Unity software in the gaming program. They're able to also program and bring things into the planetarium as well. So the um, boundaries are endless. We've tried to make the whole experience of coming to the planetarium be interesting, not just for astronomy buffs and kids who love the sky or in adults for that matter, but we've, we've really tried to make it be something where you could learn in the community. How lucky are those kids to have a planetarium? Really, I would have killed to have one of those in high school. I, I know, I was, I was just watching that. I'm like, first of all, that space looks so relaxing and yeah. calming. And then you're just like, oh, we're just gonna travel space for this period, you guys. Like that's their science class. Can you imagine that? And then to be able to use it for so many other things, which is just wonderful. What a great environment. Yeah, um, absolutely. Kids must really get into learning in that space. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's just, it's not on a, page or a, no. I guess a tablet nowadays, but yeah. um, it really comes to life when you're immersed in it. Absolutely. So I just think that's so that's cool. Wonderful. It's open to the public. Yes. So we Which can go even see better. it if we want. Let's go. The future goals of the Department of Public Health in Plymouth is to do more work in the areas of social determinants of health. What exactly does that mean? We spoke with the town's first ever public health director to get an explanation. Right now, the state of public health is in new territory. Um, as we can see right now, or as I can see it, is that we're in a phase to where we're conducting inspections, we're responding to outbreaks, um, we're trying to understand how disease is being impacted in and across the town. And I got here in August uh, with very limited information because um, typically most of our public health, uh, local public health partners are operating on Paul Revere's model um, that was, you know, almost 300 years ago. Um, and so you have a lot of public health entities on the local level calling themselves boards of health. Um, and typically uh, they operate only as board of health. We're fortunate in Plymouth to have a department of health and a board of health. So that way we can really assess the state of public health from both the regulatory side and also looking at it from the public health practice side. One of our prime objectives is to look at disease surveillance. And that means that we get to look at all the infectious disease and even some chronic disease indicators across the entire town of Plymouth. And then another piece is that we get to evaluate and do some inspections uh, for our food establishments. Also um, look at some water quality issues in terms of our septic tanks and making sure that uh, those practices are being adhered uh, from our engineering community to build those safe, um, those safe uh, types of, uh, uh, of vessels, if I may, to make sure that people's um, sewage is kept in check you know and then we also do fats oil and grease regulations and enforcement uh, making sure our private haulers are are doing what they're supposed to be doing for that type of enforcement too as well it's really exciting from my perspective to be able to look at things from a very proactive standpoint when we talk about looking at disease in communities and how um, restaurants uh, and the food quality and also uh, the safety of the food may impact disease outcomes as well um, and even water quality, correct, and air quality. I can keep going on. But the point is, is that from my position, I look at things systemically so that way we can determine who's at a greater risk and how can we mitigate that risk and what are we doing from the upstream level with our policy all the way down to the downstream level to who's getting impacted in various communities. The one-time home of the Mayflower Grove Grill on the edge of town in Pembroke has a new name and new owners. The restaurant is now known as Gather, and these first-time restaurateurs are taking their skills and experience as executive chefs to bring a rustic farmhouse chic experience to, for their patrons, and PCN stopped in for breakfast. Gather is exactly how it sounds. We want people to be able to come here, 
have a good time. Our, our tagline is quality food, quality time. And that's, that's really what we fully stand behind. This is Shelton and I's first restaurant as, on our own. Um, our background is that we are both executive chefs. Um, we've worked all over in the city on the vineyard. Chef ran a very successful catering company um, uh, for him. And we decided that you know it was about our time to you know, take everything that we have to offer and put it into practice for ourselves. On a day like today, we'll probably flip uh, maybe 125 uh, plate, flip the restaurant maybe three or four times. I've been a chef for a long time. That's the only thing that I'm really good at is cooking. Uh, as far as my catering company, the catering company was Creative Catering by Chef Shelton, very successful. Um, when we took on this adventure, we brought it all together under one umbrella. So it's still there, just a different baby. We built the bar countertop, we built the tables, uh, we had the bench built, we installed the lighting, Jamie built the chandelier. Um, there's a lot of things that we put our blood, sweat, and tears into um, to really create this um, sort of farmhouse chic uh, you know, rustic style. So we actually have a bunch of people from all over, Kingston, Hanson, Pembroke, um, Halifax, Bridgewater. It's, it's creates a very centralized meeting place for everybody uh, in this location. And everyone that we've met have been very excited that we're here. Uh, the best part of the day, I love to come out there. I like to meet the people. I like to greet the people. Uh, I'm big on feedback. Um, only thing we're doing here is just elevating food, simple food, bringing it up to a new elevation. So we wanted to have a small town that we felt that we could impact the community with. Uh, we came and looked at the area. It looked very different than how it looks in here now, um, but we have a great visionment for our team and uh, felt that this was the right place for us, somewhere that was small that we felt that we could have a great impact. And uh, from the people that I've talked to that have gone there, they said it's just very unusual and the food is delicious and the atmosphere is really unique. That's awesome. And I just have to say, I don't know if you know this, Julie, but I'm a huge foodie and breakfast is my favorite. So just looking at those shots, <laughs> I'm starving right now. Yes. And I can't wait to have my lunch. And with all new businesses, we wish them the best of luck. Yes. The South Shore Community Action Council recently hosted their 24th annual Local Heroes Awards Night. Each year, the South Shore Community Action Council has recognized those individuals and organizations that demonstrate extraordinary commitment to fighting poverty and improving the lives of low-income residents on the South Shore. PCN stopped by the Hotel 1620 in downtown Plymouth to bring us this story. We're celebrating our 24th annual Local Heroes Awards Night. It's our chance as a community action agency to shine a light on the terrific works that are happening out in our communities every day. Individuals, organizations, groups of people who are working really hard to make life better for people on the South Shore. Tonight's program will start with an introduction by our CEO, Jack Cochio. He'll be followed by our guest speaker, which we're so excited to have, Rick Middleton, the legendary Boston Bruins right winger who will be talking to us about teamwork. Um, and sharing some of his great stories with us. We'll also have a live auction tonight. We'll have a fundraising component uh, as part of tonight's program, which is really important for us as a community action agency. So many different people give in different ways. Some folks will volunteer, some folks will donate time or money. And uh, so those contributions uh, through our auction tonight are always greatly appreciated. Some of our local heroes um, are involved with our programs already, and that's how we've come to know of their great contributions to our communities. One of them is a great friend of the agency named Lisa Adams. She's uh, local to Plymouth and was really instrumental in working with us and the PTA at Indian Brook Elementary School to get our backpack food for kids program up and running. That program in its early years um, has since developed to expand to now 12 elementary schools in Plymouth and Middleborough, and we're helping to feed over 400 kids. The takeaway, I think, from this kind of an event, every year, folks are always so amazed at just how much people out there in the communities are doing to help one another. And especially nowadays, it's really important to remember your friends and your neighbors who are in need and maybe struggling with day-to-day -day things. 
So this is really an opportunity for us to shine a light on all of the great work that's happening out there in the community and to really uh, encourage people to get involved, help out, participate in your community. We are our community in action. We are so pleased to have on set today Andrew Boteri, who is the chair of the Plymouth Bay Cultural District. Yes. We are so pleased to have you here. You're going to tell us all about the Art Week that's going to go mm -hmm. on in Plymouth, which is really exciting. But before we do that, what is the Plymouth Bay Cultural District and how did it come about? Uh, the Plymouth Bay Cultural District is through the Mass Cultural Council and what they do is they uh, designate uh, cultural districts throughout the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. We are the 27th recognized cultural council um, district within the Commonwealth. And what we really do is uh, we're a nonprofit, all mm -hmm. volunteer group. Yeah. And our mission, if you will, is really to, co uh, to coordinate and collaborate with all different types of artists, uh, cultural events, whether it be theater, uh, uh, music, then also trying to pull in also the retail, the restaurants uh, and mm -hmm. also the retail uh, places within our district to be able to drive, as I like to say, to drive people through their doors and ring their registers. Yes, yes. And so our district actually encompasses uh, uh, from Samoset uh, and Court all the way through downtown to Main Street, down to the uh, waterfront. Yeah and then all the way over to Village Landing. Okay, so it's a pretty big area. It is a very big area with over 150 assets, which okay. would be the businesses. Okay, now I know that we're gonna have a restaurant week going on in Plymouth, and the piggybacking that is Art Week. Yes, uh, the Chamber uh, typically does theirs in February, but where we were really getting a lot of uh, advertising uh, statewide from Art Week of Boston, mm -hmm. which is part of the Bach Foundation, that uh, you know, Bob and Amy over at the chamber said, well, you know, let's kind of piggyback this sure. so we can have both going and uh, power in numbers, if you will. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about what goes on in Art Week. Give me some of the examples. Yeah, Art Week is just, uh, it, it's from May 27th uh, through, April, uh, excuse 27th. Me, April 27th yeah. through May 6th. Yeah. And it is a variety of different, what we call unique events. Yeah. Where we have artists partnering with businesses or with um, you know, we got a couple of, of the Second Wind Brewery, mm -hmm. and they're all doing kind of very unique events. I think one of the best ones is uh, the one that uh, Gene and Paul Quintal are doing at Plymouth Cruises on the Lobster Tail, mm -hmm. and they're going to be taking out people out onto the harbor. They're going to kind of cruise for artists, whether you're a photographer, visual uh, uh, sketchers, mm -hmm. and they're just going to cruise around the lighthouse and the bug light mm -hmm. so that these artists can be out there with an, a great view sure. uh, to be able to uh, to do that painting or, or photographing or whatever yeah, they might giving do. them the 360 of yeah. that, yeah, which yeah. is a really cool. And so that's sort of, a, uh, again, where a business uh, looked at the Art Week and said, hey, this is what we can do to incorporate the uh, an art portion yep. of our business. Into, into our business. Um, like the, one of the first things on Friday, April 27th is the Mini Clay Canvas. What is that? Yeah, that is with uh, Chicky Clay Chick uh, yeah. down at the Camelot. Which is another business. Yeah, yep. she is phenomenal. And she is going to be helping people uh, design uh, different clay items. And if you've ever been to her shop, it is just uh, incredible. Uh, she has just, you know, like kids come in with their parents and the kids can paint. Yep. So uh, she really, again, wanted to be able to jump on this whole event. And her events run uh, all the way from April 27th all the way through to May 4th as well. Okay. Um, give me some other things, some other yeah, unique uh, things that are going to happen Some very unique here. things. I think one of them is uh, Jane Kelly, who has the Fairy Door Trail. Mm -hmm. And uh, what she has coordinated with business, collaborated with businesses and artists to develop these fairy doors that are, uh, in some cases, are about this big. Yeah. They're going to be sort of hidden in uh, stores, and then the kids can go on, download a map uh -huh. that there's, there's 28 locations that like are participating a, like a in map this. Of the yeah, fairy doors. Fairy doors, almost like a scavenger hunt yeah, thing. Yeah. And you can pick them, uh, your, your, your maps up at the uh, Plymouth Library, uh, John Carver Inn, um, New Again store on, on um, South Ave, as well as something for your dust. And the kids will, go, you know, wander through the town mm -hmm. with their parents, and they, you know, of course, if they're you know, little kids uh, come in your best fairy attire, 
Why and, not? And once they've <laughs> done your wings. Oh, your wings. And once they've done all those 28 events, they then go to uh, the Plymouth Center for the Arts, where they'll receive a certificate of, of accomplishing the Fairy Door Trail. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's so different. You don't and find it, that every yeah, day. Just very, very unique. And we've also got uh, um, uh, Stephen Cariadonis of the uh, 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 Philharmonic. The Phil, yeah. He, they have an event on uh, Saturday, April 28th. It's their normal concert, but prior to that, he's going to be doing a free discussion mm -hmm. about uh, Tchaikovsky and some of the other um, uh, composers that they're going to be talking about, but being able to talk to the public about this, yeah. that is free. If you do go to that, you will get a coupon that for, for only $20 to be able to let you actually to then stay for the performance. Yeah, that's great. Um, we've got uh, Kenny over at Second Wind uh, Brewery that's going to be doing a paint your beer mug thing. Oh, fun! Yeah, fun. Uh, and I think I'm going to do that. I can't paint worth my life. <laughs> so uh, he says, don't worry about it. Just slap some paint on there yeah. and it'll look fun. So we've got, you know, stuff like that. We've also got the uh, Plymouth Harbor Knits yeah. down in Village Landing. Uh, Gene down there going to be doing some stuff on uh, how to do scarves. And they're actually going to show people how they take lamb's wool yeah. and sheep's wool and actually spin it into yarn. So again, it's a very educational yes. event uh, as well as going artistic. on as well. Yeah. As well as artistic. Yeah. Now, um, people can find all this information where? Yeah, uh, you can go to our uh, our website, which is PlymouthBayCulture.org, Culture. <laughs> uh, okay. or you can go to our Facebook page, okay. which is uh, Plymouth Bay Cultural District on our Facebook page. Okay. But on our website, on PlymouthBayCulture.org, up at the very top, you'll see a green bar and it'll say, click here, where they can actually download like you did. I did. See that? Yes. Well, yeah, let's hold this up to yeah. see what you can, this is what it's going to look like. It has all the events. It has all the events. It has the time. Most yeah. of the events are free. Yeah. Uh, some of them run anywhere from, you know, $10 to $25. Yeah. But, um, you know, we've got uh, the uh, Plymouth uh, Pilgrim Museum is participating. Uh, the, inter uh, the Antiquarian is also going to be doing Sing Through History. Yeah. And Dr. Ann Mason will be bringing people through Burial Hill singing 17th century hymns Aww. as well as patriotic songs. Oh, I that's mean, awesome. Just fantastic. That's great. So there's really something for everybody, all different age groups. All different age groups. And, and it runs the whole week from April 27th all the way through May 6th. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff at Memorial Hall, over across the street at the art shop. Yep. Um, you know, just down Main Street, right. downtown area, right. uh, as well as over to Village Landing as well. Now, is this the first time Art Week has come to Plymouth? This is the first time Art Week started. Art Week of Boston started, I believe, in 2013. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had uh, Boston and the Cape, and they were really looking for Plymouth to be the catalyst. Sure. So that during a week, people might go from Boston to Plymouth yep. to Cape Cod. Yep. And I think as we all have seen that Plymouth now really is a destination. Yes, it is, absolutely. Versus just the, as I used to call it, the redheaded stepchild between yeah. Boston and, and Oh and no, the, oh the no, we, we are it. Yes. Plymouth is it. Plymouth is it. All right, thank you so much. And we look forward, Andrew, to this entire week. And um, we'll have you back again to talk about some other wonderful thing that the Cultural District is doing. Great, Julie, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for watching. If you want to see the show again, you can check out our website and PCN is also on YouTube. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook to get up-to-date info. We'll see you next week with a brand new PCN and PCN Life. From all of us at PAC-TV, have a great week.